Hey, everyone. Welcome to Queerly Recommended, the podcast where we recommend queer books, films, TV shows, and more. I'm Tara Scott. I review sapphic fiction at the Lesbian Review and Smart Bitches Trashy Books. This week, I am so thrilled to be joined by Frederick Smith, author of six contemporary novels with romantic elements, including two co-written with Chaz Lamar Cruz. The most recent is One and Done, which I recently recommended and raved about. If you haven't listened to me do that yet, go back and find that episode. But for now, welcome, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to be here today. So for the people who are not familiar, who perhaps have not gone back and listened to that episode yet, can you tell them what One and Done is all about? So my elevator pitch is it's a Black, queer, higher ed, college, Bay Area uh, set romance novel. And it, you know, obviously follows a central couple falling in love. Dr. Taylor James is an aspiring university president who wants to be one of the first Black and openly gay university presidents one day. And he is put in charge. He's currently a vice president at a university, and he's put in charge of the university's accreditation process, which is a process where universities go through a review every eight to 10 years, make sure they're okay, student outcomes and things like that. He only allows himself one day a week to go out and have fun, Sunday fun day at a place called Bo in San Francisco's Castro area. And there he has a disastrous meet cute with Dustin McMillan, really arrogant about San Francisco, really arrogant, you know, cocky, confident, very good looking and things like that. And other than their love for Beyonce, lo and behold, a few days later, they realized that Dustin is the university accreditation person. So the person who will be reviewing the university and forced to work with Dr. Taylor James on this project. So after a disastrous meet cute, they realize they have to work together. And then the romance and the friendship and everything else ensues. I loved it. It was so fun. It was so cute. And I also really loved that the elements were subtle, but they were there about the increased scrutiny on administrators who are Black. Like it was so subtle, but there was something towards the end just referencing Claudine Gay and how she was so viciously attacked. Right. And needlessly. Absolutely. And so, I mean, you, you know, what, what's what, what's that saying? I know they say it on Scandal a lot. Uh, you know, sometimes Black people feel like they have to be twice as good to get mm -hmm. half of the accolades or advancements that they've worked and earned for. And so, yeah, there's an element in the novel where uh, I won't spoil it too much. But Taylor questions whether or not going to the university presidential level is what he really wants. Because he knows that one, being Black, you know, is one thing. Being Black and openly queer is a total other thing. Knowing how politics works in the United States and also how politics work in the universities, you know, those are like two bam bams that mm -hmm. people may use against Taylor. So this is part of Taylor's thought process as he's considering whether or not he wants to advance from a university vice president to a president is what is this going to open up for me, both in terms of my personal life, both in terms of my professional life, in terms of the people who are in the friend circle, any potential partners, et cetera. And so um, Taylor is very much aware of not only what it takes to, to become a university president, but also is very much aware of what will come with that as well in terms of working with the university com community. Sounds kind of similar to what's happening in 2024 right now with mm -hmm. someone who's running for president and they know what's coming. And I think that, you know, for Taylor and for anyone else who's thinking about advancing, who comes from a minoritized background, they realize the attacks that are going to be coming. You know, it, it's, it's lifelong training, but it's also lifelong training, like just kind of learning that um, you got to keep moving, mm -hmm. got to keep pushing on regardless of the critiques that you know that are going to come. And so that's something that Taylor thinks a lot about in One and Done and, you know, talks a lot about with the friend circle in the novel, with Dustin, who's the university reviewer, et cetera. You haven't always written kind of strictly romance, although there is romance to what you're writing. Yeah. What brought this particular book about? Like, why romance? Why now? Okay. So what really immersed me into the whole romance genre 
really was the pandemic. And when all of these book events went virtual, when we were stuck inside for health reasons, which I totally value, you know, different authors would take their events and put them on Zoom. And so we could be all over the world, all over the U.S., all over Canada, watching authors talk about, you know, so one, it was romance in, romance in particular. And I was watching a lot of Alyssa Cole, Rebecca Weatherspoon, some other people who were putting on events with bookstores, getting us to, um, you know, think about considering them, reading and stuff like that. And then as I started thinking about my, my own author career, I thought, you know, this is a, a direction I really want to move into in terms of the more formulaic elements of romance novels. Because of one, the, the built-in audience that just loves mm -hmm. romance and is open to trying all types of books and everything. But then two, because of my respect for the romance genre in general, knowing that romance keeps the lights on for most of the publishing industry, mm -hmm. um, also knowing that and, and learning and respecting the fact that it, it's a, it, it has been a women-driven industry in terms of who writes, consumes, runs, edits. And knowing that sometimes, you know, that women often face critiques for just wanting to be loved, wanting to have yeah. a happily ever after, wanting to provide something that's going to provide some comfort for people. And so that made me respect romance even more. It made me want to take a deeper dive in terms of my author career into shifting from just contemporary with romantic elements into the romance genre itself. I've always written you know, primarily male-male romance, male-male uh, couples, primarily Black characters, primarily, you know, a few Latinx characters here and there, et mm -hmm. cetera. But back to your question, it was pandemic 2020, 2021, events going virtual, and just growing in my love and respect for the authors who are part of our community, for the books that they were writing. Of course, I bought so many books during pandemic <laughs> that are still on my nightstand. Some I open up, some I have on my um, devices. But that, that was just a really fruitful time when we were stuck inside um, that really made me take the deeper dive into romance. Have you noticed a difference in reception for One and Done compared to your other books that weren't kind of specifically oh romance? Goodness. Yes. And it's kind of scary <laughs> and it's kind of uh -huh. fun and it's kind of interesting. So, mm -hmm. you know, my backlist, which I hope that people will explore after listening to this or while listening to this, is pretty extensive. You know, like I share, does focus on male, male romantic elements, mostly in California, Los Angeles, or the San Francisco Bay Area. But one and done, the reception has just been out of this world in terms of the novels I've written like and yeah. it's almost kind of scary but it but it also makes sense too you know I know that authors you know so one piece of advice I often share with aspiring authors is that you're not going to come out the gate with a, a a New York Times bestseller or a USA Today bestseller that it takes mm -hmm. a lot of building up building up cultivating audience cultivating friendships and relationships within the book community the romance community etc but when I've seen things, responses to one and done, you know, it really makes me happy and proud that after six novels, I'm getting a really strong reception. You know, back in May of 2024, prior to the novel's publication, the Boston Globe did this list of the 75 books of the summer to read. And when I got that notification from my publisher, mm -hmm. didn't expect it, didn't know it. And I'm like, how the Boston Globe hear about this novel and put on the list of 75 <laughs> people? Yeah. Or even just as recently in July 2024, there was a feature on NPR about eight romance novels. That's um, amazing. And, and with some and with, with some contemporary peers, romance peers, who I'm like, I fanboy you. <laughs> We're on the same list and everything. Yeah. And so yeah, the um the response to one and done has just been amazing. Many of the bookstores that, you know, I'm in relationship with say they can't keep enough on the shelf. You know, I check the online retailers and I see that it says sold out, back mm -hmm. order. And so, you know, I'm always kind of gently talking with the publisher about we got to get more books in print, you know, yeah. and, and I, I know how that works. I know that that, you know, it's kind of a calculated gamble in terms of what's the print run going to be? 
how do we distribute and where and everything, but I've been very happy with the response to um, one and done. That is amazing. I mean, I don't know how, you know, Boston Globe and NPR would hear about you per se, but I think also there's something very special about like, it, it's hard enough in the first place to find male, male romance where it is two two black men, two black men in higher education. You're not like, I think you might've written the only one. I could be wrong. This is based on not doing a search, but like, it's possible you've written the only one, but also that you're a queer black man writing it, knowing that so much of the male, male romance that's out there, because there is a tremendous amount of it. I found male, male romance and was reading it way before I found lesbian romance. Like yeah. it was just easier to find because mainstream publishers were actually putting it out there but it was almost exclusively written by women. And I think there are readers now who want to know, and, and I'm, I'm one of them. That's why I picked up one and done was okay. But what happens when a man is writing yeah, yeah this yeah. romance and it's not just, and, and recognizing that I may not be the target audience mm -hmm. because my hope would be, you know, you're writing for men who want to see themselves first and foremost, like queer men who want to read about queer men, but also, I'm sure you're quite happy to have anybody read your books, but it is different. And I can't explain why it's different from the others that I read, but there's just this like intangible quality, I think, that comes from writing from the self to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so like, like kind of in the own voices, you know, conversation mm -hmm. that a lot of writers have in terms of what feels authentic, what's, what, 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 what's written in a way that 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 you're not explaining things or over explaining things, you know, to people. Mm -hmm. So so I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna get back to the you know who writes mail mail and things like that. But there's this really great Toni Morrison interview that people can find on YouTube where she talks about that whole idea of own voices, but mm -hmm. in the sense of she she was sharing in this interview that she could tell when a black author was writing something with like a gaze gaze g-a-z-e yep yep um, you know of, of, of a white or mainstream audience um because mm. she said they were they were over explaining things that did not have to be explained yes if the person was willing to do some work and research and learning and immersing in communities and things like that and so i always think about that interview with tony morrison um when i think about the whole topic of own voices and the respect that I have for, you know, people who, who, who eventually get their work out and they're from and of a community. Mm -hmm. So fun fact, I did not know that even as recent as like 2020, 2021, I didn't realize that quite a bit of male, male romance was written by women. I yep. did not know that at all. For um, women too, like for and, a female audience. Yes. W w which is exciting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I do believe that people can and have the capability of writing, you know, whatever they want and everything. And I also think at the same time, you know, I think it takes a a, a certain sense of responsibility to, and, and I'm sure everyone works with beta readers, they have their groups of people, their focus groups and everything that kind of say, does this sound real? Does this sound authentic? Mm -hmm. Is this what two men would do together? You know, and so... I took a couple of dives into a, a, a few, recently a couple of male, male romances written by people who I, who, who, who identify as women. And, you know, I've read them, good novels, you know, as, mm -hmm. as long as they follow the romance formula, I'm cool with that and everything. And there were times I would, I, I would read stuff and, and I would be like, I don't know if that's how two gay men would connect with each other. Mm -hmm. um, or something kind kind of like you were sharing. Something just felt a little bit like either over explained or not truly like um, I don't even representative. Know yeah, and so going back to the whole question, I do think own voices is important. I do think that mm -hmm. anyone can write anything. I do think that it also takes a, a responsible author just to you know share it with others before publishing asking questions, asking, is this responsible? Is this representative? But obviously there's a market. And as long yeah. as there's a market of readers and writers, you know, we're going to fulfill everyone's reading desires. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to take, go, go back in your history. Okay. And because of course, this is a podcast about queer media of all kinds, but what was the first 
book or film with LGBTQ uh, representation. It could really be an, any medium. Maybe it was a video game. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was an album. Uh, but what was the first that really had a big impact on you and why? Okay. So there was an, uh, an author. He's no longer with us. His name is E. Lynn Harris. He passed away in 2009. And he wrote a couple of books in the night. Well, actually more like 10, 15 novels in the 90s and 2000s. The first books by him that I remember reading were Invisible Life and Just As I Am. And Elon Harris's books, and, and he was writing these long before people were like, you know, embracing male, male romance. Mm -hmm. This is back in the 90s and 2000s. Just As I Am and Invisible Life follows the lives of, of Black gay men in the U.S. South I think primarily Atlanta area, but eventually they make their way to New York City. And it's like kind of college and just coming out of college. So kind of new adult, but also coming into their own in terms of either a gay awakening or a bisexual awakening. And when I read those novels, Just As I Am and um, Invisible Life, it was the first time in a novel that I truly felt like I saw myself as a Black gay person. And, and also gave a sense of validation, like, wow, there's a Black gay man writing about Black gay characters mm -hmm. in the South that was just so empowering. It was almost like, it's like, oh, this, this doesn't have to be hidden anymore. Even though as teenagers, we snuck the books around and we had to keep them in our backpacks or we had to hide them under the beds and things like that because of, you know, life wasn't then what it is yeah. now in 2024. And, you know, and in the future and everything. And so Elon Harris was such a influence on me personally in terms of my mm -hmm. own personal development, you know, as a Black queer man. And also in terms of seeing the possibilities as a writer as well. I know before Elon Harris, there was James Baldwin, mm -hmm. another writer named James Earl Hardy, who was kind of a peer with Elon Harris. But Elon Harris's novels were the first where I really felt seen. And felt validated as a, wow, it's possible for me, you know, little Black boy growing up in Detroit, yeah. Michigan, to aspire to be an author, to tell my own stories um, about people who I see and who look like me and who come from backgrounds such as me. And so I am always so thankful for the books of Elon Harris. And I always encourage current readers to, to take a deep dive into backlists of authors who maybe aren't, you know, getting the splashy bookstagram posts every week and things like that. Take a deep dive in the people who, who paved the road for the books that we see today. And so, yeah, I always go back to Elon Harris as being instrumental in my uh, personal and professional and author life. Oh, that's huge. I wonder, is do you know if he's still in print? He is still in print. Oh, amazing. Um, and what's so exciting about Elon Harris's books is that he was making the New York Times bestseller list with Black queer romance novels. Before Whoa. we call them, you know, MM romance novels, they all mm -hmm. have romantic elements. All of his novels made the New York Times bestseller list back in the 90s and 2000s. And it was, it was around that whole idea of cultivating audience. He knew his audience. He sold books out of his trunk of his car. He drove to pride festivals. He even went to like black barber shops and beauty shops because he knew that mm. while people are sitting there getting their hair done and getting their hair cut, they needed something to look at and read. And so he is also an inspiration to me just in terms of thinking about the marketing work that authors have to do, maybe not yes. always want to do. So I think of it and I'm like, wow, that's the 90s and 2000s that Elon Harris was doing this. You know, so it, it's just amazing and awe-inspiring to me. And so I hope that more people will go back and take a look at his backlist of books because they were just so instrumental and so important and paved the way for our male-male romance as we see it today. Mm -hmm. So if people were to start with one, like, what do you think is a good entry point to his work? I would say, so I'm, I'm forgetting, I, I can't remember if it's Just As I Am or Invisible Life, but those are the first two mm -hmm. novels. And so that's the entry point because then yeah. what happens in his series is that you know, like most novels, it's world building. So maybe novel three, novel seven will have a character who was in one of the first novels who mm -hmm. will get kind of their own story. But they always go back to the initial couple of Raymond and Basil 
And, um, and so Raymond and Basil and their friend group become this world of these, you know, 10, 12 novels that Elin Harris wrote. So yeah, I, I will start with, it's either Invisible Life or Just As I Am. Mm -hmm. I love that. So how did you start your own journey as an author? <laughs> so um, when I finished grad school, I moved out to Los Angeles with the aspiration of writing for a soap opera called The Young and the Restless. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> However, my professional roots were in higher education. And so, you know, I, I took on a job at a university, Cal State LA in Los Angeles, where I did like a lot of cultural programs and events and things like that. That helped me meet a lot of artists, authors, you know, helped me develop a community. But I always had this, this nagging thing in the back of my head saying, I really want to be an author. Young and Restless never called, never worked out. But I started taking some creative writing classes at UCLA across town. My writing teacher, her name was Carrie Madden, great teacher. Um, she writes YA novels. She's based in Tennessee now. She really took to my work that eventually became my first novel down for whatever. And so every week I would write these chapters about Black men going to a nightclub in Los Angeles. And she and the classmates were so fascinated with these stories, I guess, because they never knew Black men went out to nightclubs or anything like that. So every week they would ask, <laughs> right. well, write about this one, write about this one. Eventually that became Down for Whatever, my very first novel, which is about four best friends looking for love in all the wrong places in L.A. Um, mm -hmm. And there are happy endings in it, too, even though it's not a categorically romance novel. So fast forward, Carrie Madden asked me to join her writer's group following the class. In her writer's group, there was a, a, a writer named Denise Hamilton who writes Los Angeles-based mystery novels. She was also um, mm. a, 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 a reporter for the LA Times. So this just goes to show how just being in community with people, you never know how people are going to talk, talk about you or whatever. So I had been doing the whole trying to get a literary agent, you know, pitching to publishers that 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 took unagented work and everything. Rejection after rejection after rejection after rejection. One President's Day weekend, Denise Hamilton was in New York City celebrating the release of one of her novels going from hardback to softcover. Mm -hmm. And she was at this party and it was her book event. But she started talking about me who was in the writing group that she was in and like yeah there, there's this guy writing these you know kind, kind of this waiting to exhale kind of novel about these four best friends da, 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 da. john sconamilio senior editor at kensington books overheard her inquired more and like on that monday or tuesday morning after the three-day weekend he emailed me and said i heard about you from denise hamilton can you send me the manuscript just like, wow. so like I had been simultaneously doing all this, you know, getting all the rejections. Mm -hmm. I, I've tossed them all. I don't want to have all that negative karma around no. me or anything like no. that. <laughs> but John Sconamilio, wonderful person, wonderful editor. Two weeks later, after sending him the manuscript set, we'd like to offer you a two book deal. Kenzie. That's amazing. And so, wow, it just happened like that. And so, you know, so, so the lesson there, I always try to talk to, you know, anyone, any profession, like you got to be nice to people, you know, you got to be supportive. Mm -hmm. You never know what people are going to be saying about you anywhere. And so mm -hmm. every, you know, everyone's always you know, kind of observing us. And so for that to happen that quickly is a blessing that I'm always thankful for. Because I know it's not that easy for everyone. And I'm not saying it was easy because I had had, you know, several hundred rejections. But mm -hmm. to have that word of mouth just meant a lot to me. And so I'm always thankful for Carrie Madden, for Denise Hamilton, John Sconamilio, for getting me into Kensington. After the two big deal, sales weren't what they expected or wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had to think about what was next in terms of my writing career and I don't know how I discovered Bold Strokes books. Mm -hmm. I, I might have just been Googling, you know, gay publishers, gay novels, who, who takes an agent. Oh, because my agent also left when I left, when I got yeah. brought by Kensington. And so I found Bold Strokes books and mm -hmm. my last four novels have been with them. Wonderful, wonderful publisher who I've enjoyed being with as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's the thing that's interesting about Bold Strokes books. I mean, if, you, if for any of the lesbian readers, they know them very, very well because that's the home of Melissa Beard, 
wow i put together georgia beers and melissa Braden. amazing <laughs> chris were here she would be laughing at and me Radcliffe chris is a publisher and, exactly like you know so funny? Started i have a co-worker it. so i have i have a i have a co well we've been co-workers for about two years now and when she came yeah. and she found out that i'm an author and i told her what label i was on she's from boston katie and she was like i grew up reading Old strokes books mm -hmm. and novels. And when I left Boston, I had to leave them all behind with a library because I couldn't bring all those novels. And I was like, Katie, hey, you know about Bold Strokes? But she was like, Yes, that <laughs> helped me grow up. That helped me find my lesbian yeah. sense of sensibilities and everything. Yes. And so I, I do think it's cool that they try to, as much as possible, serve sort of that like full spectrum. They do publish trans books, they publish gay male books, and even bringing back certain authors of, of classics, like when, like Lee Lynch mm -hmm. taking her backlist and bringing it all back into print was yeah. so important. So yeah, so you've been published by a mainstream publisher. You're now with, you know, a mid-sized publisher, but that's focused exclusively on LGBTQ fiction. So what do you find are the differences between working with both? Well, both of those books is, is really supportive. It's like, one, the authors all know each other, or mm -hmm. well, pretty much know each other or learn of each other. Yeah. Um, a very supportive community, both in terms of, you know, supporting each other's books, um, supporting each other in terms of the writing process, doing events together and things like that. Mm -hmm. I love that it's so easy to just email someone with a quick question. You know, I, tr I try not to bug people too much because I can have sure. a million questions because I work in academia, so I can mm -hmm. have a million questions. But I'm like, I'm not the only author. There's hundreds of others they're working with. So let me just keep a focused question. But but I I love that personal aspect in terms of the editors there, in terms of the the marketing team, in terms of the acquisitions, you know, process and everything. And I I love the fact that it's a it, it you know it, it has built a reputation for high quality LGBTQ novels. And they mm -hmm. really care about the quality of the novels that come out. You know, they're not just putting stuff out there just to say it's queer, it's out here, but it's high quality literature and everything. And I would say the main difference between being at Bold Strokes and like kind of a, a you know, a larger publisher is, 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 you know, larger publisher, of course, more resources, more ability to kind of help push your book and everything, mm -hmm. but kind of a little less of the personal touch. Although John Scott Emilio and I had a great relationship, you know, we're still connected on social media and everything. But but you know, yeah, you're you're like one of a million pieces. You know what the it book is going to be of the season, and most likely yeah. it's not going to be you. So you're like, okay, I got to figure out this whole doing events and marketing myself with a larger publisher. But you know, both places, Kensington and Bolstrokes Books, very supportive places, and I've been so grateful with the experiences I've had at both. Mm -hmm. So you talked about who really inspired you in the beginning. Who's inspiring you now as you're kind of in the, the present with your author journey, but where you're also looking ahead towards the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So who inspires me? So a many, a few weeks ago, I heard uh, you all recommend a book called A Little Kissing Between Friends by Chensia. Oh, Sibiris. yes. I love, I love that Chensia's one. Chensia's books. And, you know, and I, I know there's the other, it's like the reality show dating book that she wrote a few years back. Yeah, so. that was fun. That was fun, that too. One. I really enjoyed that one. But this one, for me, I didn't know I've been waiting for a friends to lovers romance that is just so messy yes as she did it <laughs> she really did and um i got to meet her uh recently at an online event and she's wonderful and so i'm always looking forward to what chencia c higgins is going to write mm -hmm. um, i've also been reading this summer has been my reading of of lesbic sapphic yeah. romance so i also yeah. read a book called the 710 split by carmen lee Oh, I have that on my list. It, it, it's a second chance romance novel, two black women um, working together in a high school and they have to coach that they get asked to coach the bowling team. Mm -hmm. It is so small town, really great book and everything. And then, of course, there, there, there's this other novel that's on my TBR called, I think it's called Second Night Stand. And it, it's okay. a married couple, Faye and Corellia Stets Waters. That's on oh. my TBR. And so I'm looking forward to that as well. It's about a couple of dancers. Um, one does burlesque, one does ballet, 
And I think they're they're trying to do some kind of reality show around dancing and they meet and have a one night stand and then they figure, let's do it again. And that so I am really excited, you know, excited about that book. So a couple of people who really, really inspire me now. It, it, it's straight romance, but Kennedy Ryan, who I consider mm-hmm. like the queen of current contemporary romance novels, is like my, you know, yeah. I'm such a fanboy. <laughs> and yeah. and I, I just love how Kennedy Ryan's writing career has just blossomed and grown, you know, huge mm-hmm. backlist, like 2025 20, novels. But I think she's showing authors the work that it takes, you know, to to build an audience, to build a community, to care about your readers you know, to show them respect by Mm -hmm. uh, researching thoroughly, even about communities that she's not a part of. And I love that process. You know, when she talks, when I listen to her on podcasts or at events, she talks about how, you know, I'm a journalist first before I even write. And if I'm writing about a community that's not me, I make sure that I do dozens of interviews with people beforehand so that I'm capturing their voices in the Mm -hmm. most authentic and respectful way. And so I appreciate hearing that a lot from Kennedy Ryan in her interviews. And then I just have to say, finally, before I, because I, I could talk about books all day. I'm sure we could talk totally. about books all day too. Oh, yes. But um, why am I just now discovering and reading the novels of Beverly Jenkins? I've always known Beverly oh, Jenkins. Oh, yeah. Detroit area, Black historical romance novels, Old West back in the 1800s, post-Reconstruction and post-enslavement. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm I'm reading this uh, Wild West series right now. I just finished a book she wrote called Forbidden. Yeah. And now I'm reading the second novel in that series called Breathless. And they're just so magical. And so, um, yeah, Beverly Jenkins is high up on my list as well. And uh, a, a Detroit, Michigan area author. So I'm like, my roots are in Michigan. And so it's nice mm-hmm. to know that there's someone from that area that Michigan is producing authors as well. And she's just had such tremendous success and she's so good. So good. You know, and again, going back to the whole research in terms of writing authentically, um, I love the fact that she had been a research librarian before being an author. And so Mm -hmm. it was always taking in Black history, Black history in the West and how that plays a part in what she writes. And so going back to our initial question about who can write what, you know, yeah. um, I, I think to write respectfully and to honor the communities that may not be our own identities, it goes back to that, you know, approaching it from a, a, a doing some research, talking to people to mm-hmm. really capture those voices in an authentic way. Absolutely. We're going to go a little more serious, but I think absolutely important. Mm-hmm. There's an organization called Authors Against Book Bans, and they're doing just a phenomenal job of highlighting the risks to continuing access to LGBTQ representation in fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think they were really focused on some of those more grassroots style bands initially. And right now, of course, you know, we know Project 2025 would be a nightmare Absolutely. for many people if enacted, but specifically calling, they're calling out LGBTQ representation in media, mm-hmm. calling it pornography, threatening, you know, that, that librarians would be jailed, these kinds of things. So what would you recommend to people who want to do something just to make sure that we're always able to read literature that represents us? Mm -hmm. So um, I always recommend people getting involved on the local level first. So whether it's a school board, a library board, even just sending a postcard or a letter to the person who represents you in whatever part of the world that you're in, to let them know where you stand in terms of, you know, these issues such as book bans, Project 2025, LGBTQ representation, people, et cetera. Starting local, I think, is so important because it's a local level that oftentimes impacts us quicker. Although Project 2025 is pretty scary in terms Mm -hmm. of what I'm seeing in terms of what it would do nationally to and about queer literature librarians just wanting to provide open access to people, even authors, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm I'm hoping that more and more of the podcasts that focus on queer media, straight media, et cetera, will talk more about the impact on authors. A lot of the book podcasts, I hope that we'll we'll take on this conversation as well. I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. I also think that other things we can do if we're, if we're able to, you know, make sure that, that you're borrowing 
LGBTQ books from your local library so that they see that there's a market and a need and a desire, whether it's audio books, electronic books, or mm -hmm. going physically to the library, just borrowing it. So it, it, it kind of, you know, puts a blip in the system, like someone's checking this out and everything. If you have the ability in terms of, you know, financial, because it's an investment to buy a book. You got to think, mm -hmm. am I going to buy this book or am I going to buy lunch sometimes? But, you know, if you're able, going to local we are owned independent bookstores or just independent bookstores in general and going to their queer lit section and picking up a book, buying something can be meaningful both for the store and for the book in terms of its sales as well. And so those are some quick, easy things that I say that people should do um, in terms of um, this whole topic of book bans, politics, um, mm -hmm. et cetera. It's pretty scary out there. Like, like when, when, when I heard about the connection of just calling everything under the LGBTQ umbrella pornography. Yes. And, and, and the implications around jailing people, putting people in prison for either writing or providing. I'm like, that is scary. And of course, that, that, that harkens back to things we've seen happening in Europe back in the 30s, uh -huh. 40s, 50s. And, 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 and do we want to, I think that we are bigger than the small mindedness that is out there. And so that's why when I think about this election that's coming up in the US, I'm so optimistic about the choices that we have about whether it's we're moving forward or whether or not people are trying to go back to a time that wasn't inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm full of a lot of hope and optimism about what's going to be happening in the US in terms of the upcoming um, election cycle. Yes. We actually, in the, in the last episode that Chris and I recorded, so for people who are listening, this will be the last episode that you just listened to. Fred and I are recording this at the very end of July. This episode should be going up mid-August or something like that. But in that episode, I was kind of like talking a little bit about this. Like we're trying to find people to talk to on this show to figure out like what we should be doing collectively. And it was very you know, coming off of going to GCLS, which was like going to that conference was so exciting. I'd never been before. I loved it so much, but also seeing what was happening with project 2025 and seeing talk of reviving the Comstock act as one example that that could be a mechanism for enforcing that you can't actually distribute LGBTQ representation in media, because I think a lot of people don't understand the reason why, say, if you go back to the lesbian pulps of the 1950s, why so many of the women in them died or were yeah. institutionalized or had some kind of a severe punishment was because the Comstock Act from the late 1800s said that it was illegal for mm -hmm. the United States Postal Service to deliver lewd and lascivious. And so anything queer fell under that. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's being talked about being revived mainly in the context of banning the distribution of abortion drugs. But like, let's be real. That's right. If they can use it for this too. But so kind of talking about that last time and how there was this feeling of darkness and despair. And I'm not saying it's time to stop being concerned but it was like less than an hour later that the announcement that Biden was dropping out of the race happened. Like we had mm -hmm. finished recording and that announcement came out and I was like, whoa, what's this going to mean? And now you and I are recording this less than a week later and the world feels so different and it's not done. There are still months and heck, who knows what's going to come between now you and I sitting here together and yeah. when this actually goes live. But I, I do think it's important that we're all doing what we can, that these small actions all add up to a lot in terms of showing how important it is. Absolutely. You know, and the other thing, you know, he, hearing you talk about this right now, the other thing I think we can do, and I think we can all do it. I think we're all, so I have this philosophy in life that we're all teachers mm -hmm. and we're all role models. And so in terms of being teachers, we know that there is a lot of misinformation Yes. That happens. And, you know, we might have people in our friend circles or our family circles who don't have accurate information. And so mm -hmm. I think that something easy that we all can do is when we get accurate information or we do read something and understand is that we can share and we can actually gently correct people and say, you know what, I heard what you said. I don't think that's fully correct. I can give you some correct information if you'd like it. 
um, mm -hmm. and offer them that opportunity to kind of course correct. And I think that's something we all can and need to do because not everyone reads and everyone looks, you know, goes on Google to look up what's true facts about da 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 da. And so I mm -hmm. think that, you know, as we all learn about things happening or or that 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 some political parties want to do, um, I think that one of the easy things we can do is help provide people with accurate information. And we can correct people online in a gentle way if we want to. Of course. You know, in our gatherings, we can also correct people or provide them with with information. It's surprising to me how um, what what's that saying? They call it kind of low information voters, like people who just kind of vote based on an emotion and a feeling and not. Oh, yeah. Act. And so I mm -hmm. think that for for one of our responsibilities is to help low information voters kind of become high information voters. Mm -hmm. mm, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to ask you the most unfair question of all, <laughs> which is if you could only recommend one piece of queer media to the people who are listening, what would it be? I'm kind of a podcast person. So besides mm -hmm. Queerly Recommended. Of course, of um, course. <laughs> I'm going to sneak into Bad okay. Queers and Minority Report are two of my other favorite queer focused podcasts I listen to. Um, mm -hmm. Both focus on issues around queer people of color. And um, bad queers tends to focus more on uh, lesbian um, issues, but queer in general. And then Minority Report focuses on, you know, primarily a male, pers gay male perspective, mm -hmm. but also open to the whole community and about the whole community as well. So those are two pieces of media I recommend. I'm a podcast love it. person. Oh, absolutely. No, I love that. That's great. I definitely have to check those out. That is all for this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. How can people connect with you if they want to find you online? Uh, website, fredericklsmith.com. I'm on most social media at fsmith827, or you could just simply Google Frederick Smith one and done and something will pop up about me. Oh, most definitely <laughs> something will pop up. Yeah, just thank you so much. This has been thank such you. a pleasure. Thank you. For everyone listening, if you've enjoyed the show and you haven't subscribed yet on your app, please make sure you do so you get notified when we release new episodes. If you have a friend that you think would like the show, tell them all about it. And if you want to support us, we have links in our show notes for our coffee, our newsletter, our social media sites, or you can just search for Really Recommended and you'll find them on there too. Goodbye, everybody. Sure.